Good morning, everybody. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM Tacoma, The Sound. My name is Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of Across Campus. This is a show that's designed to be a forum for students and faculty here at the University of Puget Sound to get their ideas and thoughts out on the air. And so I'm here to work the soundboard and to facilitate discussion, but really this is supposed to be a time for them to show a different side of the university. And so today in the studio, we're going to be talking about the beautiful game. And when I say the beautiful game, I'm talking about football. And when I say football, I'm talking about soccer. And when I say soccer, I'm talking about the beautiful game. And so we have two students here in the studio today. We have Dylan Richmond and Stephen Baum and Professor Sunil Kukreja. And he is a comparative sociology professor here at the University of Puget Sound. So great to have you all in the studio today. Good to Thank be you. Here. Great to be here. Thank you. All right, so I'm going I'm to start with our two students in the studio today, Dylan and Stephen. Uh, starting with Dylan, how did you find the class? And or sorry, let's start with just how you got to the University of Puget Sound. Um, well, when I was looking at schools, I really wanted to stay in the Northwest. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and so I was looking for a small liberal arts college somewhere in the Northwest. I kind of wanted to get out of Oregon, so I decided Washington would be a good choice. I narrowed my search down to Whitman and UPS. Didn't really like Walla Walla, so I applied early decision to UPS. Here I am. All right, sweet deal. And so at what point did you just look at this class, and when did you sign up for it? Um, about a month until school started over the summer, I was looking at seminars and trying to decide what I wanted to sign up for. And my brother's friend has actually taken this class in the past, and so he told me about it. And it sounded interesting. I've been into soccer my whole life. So I kind of looked for this class specifically as one of my first choices. And I mean, when I saw it, signed up, got in, luckily. All right, sweet deal. And were you a soccer player in the past, or how did you first relate to the beautiful game? Um, I've played soccer my whole life up through high school. I decided I'm not playing here. But, it, yeah, I've played probably 14 years of soccer. All right, and we, still click, we still kick it in intramural and club soccer, so oh, yeah. we, get our, we get our playing minutes in. Oh, yes. All right, and Stephen, uh, where are you from? How did you get to the university? And when did you first find this class? So I'm from Walnut Creek, California, in the Bay Area. And kind of like Dylan, I knew that I wanted to go to a small liberal arts school. And I narrowed it down to Puget Sound, Willamette, and Whitman. And Puget Sound just seemed like the best fit. Um, and kind of like Dylan, I played soccer my whole life, uh, played throughout high school. Um, decided that I wasn't going to play here, but I really love the game. And uh, when I was looking at classes and looking at seminars, this looked really, 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 really interesting. And I thought, you know, taking a class about soccer, that'd be awesome because it's something that I love. So, Yeah, I'm jealous of you guys. I am in the honors program here at the university, and so they pick out all the core classes for you. And this is one of your core classes that you take as a freshman. Yeah. And I considered dropping out of my honors program just so I could take the beautiful game. I mean, when, when I was looking at the university, this is one of the classes that made this school sound awesome. Yeah. And so I think it's re really one of those fun, cool classes that makes that kind of makes Puget Sound stand out there. So, All right, and our third guest, uh, Professor Sunil Kukreja. Uh, where are you from? And I'd love to know a little bit more about how you first got into the beautiful game, first from just a spectator standpoint or perhaps from a player standpoint, and then... How did you move into the academics of the beautiful game? Well, let me tell you a little bit about uh, where I'm from. Um, I originally moved out here to Tacoma uh, in 1991 uh, from Virginia, where I was uh, at another position, a temporary position after finishing graduate school. Uh, but prior to that, <clears throat> my background takes me uh, back to the Midwest, went to school in Kansas and in Minnesota, actually. Uh, but then originally I'm from Malaysia, which is where I got into the beautiful game as a kid. Uh, that was the only game I really knew and, and uh, enjoyed. Uh, but then once I went off to college, I kind of forgot about it all. Just because back in those days, we didn't have internet and everything like that to know what was happening in the sport. And, and there was very little information yeah. in the U.S. about soccer around the world. So... Um, but I came here in, in 91 at Puget Sound and uh, as a member of the Comparative Sociology Department 
And at that time, the International Political Economy Program also got off the ground. Uh, but it wasn't until a few years ago that Professor Mike Vseth actually uh, first beat me to it and introduced this course on the books uh, of our curriculum and started teaching it as a first-year seminar. And so as soon as I saw him do that, I, I told him, I've got to get in on this too. <laughs> <laughs> and he was good enough to... to um, uh, allow me to teach it as well. So we, he and I have both been teaching it now for a few years, and I and I hear that there might be one or two other faculty members who want to get into it as well down the yeah. road. Well, I think we're all jealous. It's one of the cool classes here at the university. So, yeah, it sounds like you have a great got a great time in that class. And this particular uh, this particular course is a residential seminar, actually. And I am the RA of that hallway in Todd Fibbs. It's one of the freshman halls here on campus. So this is a different program that the university started a while ago, but they've been doing it more and more. I think last year they just had one or two hallways, but this year they have five or six. And the idea is that people from the class also live together in the hallway. So I, I, th I think you guys have a roster of 16, 17 people in, in the class and of those, maybe 14, yeah, 14 or 15. Them, most of them live together. Yeah, so all live together in the same hallway. So that adds an extra dynamic to the class that we're going to be talking about more later on the studio. But what can you guys tell me about you know, who, who takes this class and what have you guys been getting out of it so far? Um, I think it's, it's really cool that there are people in the class who are who are really into soccer to begin with. And then there are people in the class who um, weren't as familiar with the game. Uh, but I think that's really interesting because it brings like a lot of different perspectives. Um, so you, you have people who, who are familiar with the game, who know, who know the game, who know teams, um, who know players. And then you have people who, who may not have watched the game, who may have watched it a little bit. Um, but I think it's really interesting. And I think it leads to a lot of really good discussions. Um, especially, especially more so because of how the class is constructed, um, and especially because of how we live together. I think that's really, that, that makes for good discussions too. And Dylan, your roommate got a bit of a surprise when he first showed up to class. <laughs> he, he did. Um, my roommate is a football player. I think we have two American football players in our class. And on the first day of class, I was kind of talking with my roommate about it. And he admitted to me that he originally thought when he signed up that the class was on American football, seeing the title being the beautiful game, <laughs> a class about football. So I thought that was a little bit funny. He he still enjoys the class. He thinks it's really fun, but a little mix up. I wonder where he got that impression from. Actually, yeah, there was the head coach of the New York Jets, Rex Ryan, wrote a book called The Beautiful Game. And it was about his experience with American with American football. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, a footballer like myself looked at that book and said, no, I think Pele grabbed that title and, he's, and we're using it to describe actual football, soccer. So, but yeah, I think that might, may have been part of where he got that from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Professor Kukreja, uh, when you designed the course, uh, what kind of students do you have in mind and like, who, what kind of a student does the class typically attract? That's that's a great question. Um, you know, as Stephen was saying, we have a, a mixed group. Some who know the game quite well have played it and had a good exposure to it for several years. And then there are others who might be uh, quite new to it all and, and may barely have a sense of, of some of the rules of the game, let alone a familiarity with different leagues around the world and different players so it makes it tricky and the whole point about our first year seminars is to have courses that are accessible and that's the key uh, we we have no prerequisites in these seminars uh, for who who may enroll in them and so as a result um, the course has to be this course as do other seminars have to be designed in such a way that um, they are able to introduce students into a subject matter um, in a very challenging and engaging fashion. But at the same time, 
uh, be accessible. So there's a fine balance there, and what uh, I hope I've managed to do is to have a set of readings that um, <clears throat> are staggered in such a way that um, some are a little more, a little more mainstream journalistically written that <clears throat> one can develop an amount of foundation about the game, and then others that give students a very good flavor of um, academic writings in, in the field that deal with the sport um, and some of the political economy issues that surround the sport so that they get, they get uh, challenged to unpack some of that material. One of the books we use that's um, very historical and very dense is, is, as the two of these guys know, is um, Goldblatt's book on The Ball is Round. And um, it's a well over 900-page book, and it's quite dense. Um, and unless you have some familiarity, both about 20th century history and mm -hmm. the game as well, it can be quite challenging to unpack. Uh, but that's the whole idea is to have students grapple with some material that could be very engaging um, <clears throat> and yet yet make them a work towards understanding what college work can be about, which is quite a bit of analysis and interpretation mm -hmm. and, and discussion. All right. Once again, you're listening to Across Campus. I'm your host, Casey Krolchek. We're going to take a quick break. But I have a special guest here in the studio today. Imogen Barwick is my host sister from New Zealand, and she's going to be doing our station identification. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Across Campus on KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. I'm Casey Krolchek, and I'm the host of the show. And today we're, going to, we're talking about the beautiful game. It's a class here at the University of Puget Sound. And it's also a residential seminar, uh, and it's located in the se on the second floor of Todd Fibbs, where I'm the RA, and I have two of my residents here in the studio today, as well as their professor. And so I just, we're going to be talking about that residential seminar aspect in the second segment of the show. And so I'm going to start by directing this to Dylan and Stephen, the two students. Uh, what can you tell me about the dynamics that the hallway element of the class creates for you? Um, well, I think it's really cool that it's a residential seminar because just by <clears> living <throat> together, everybody is really comfortable with, with each other. Um, so when we get to class, I think people are a lot more willing to share their opinions um, and really talk about things. And I think that breeds um, a lot better discussions than, than other classes where people may not live together. They might not be as familiar with each other. Um, so they're not as comfortable maybe bringing up their own opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah, to add on to what Steven said, also like in the hall when I'm working on essay or when I'm doing the reading, if I have questions, there's 14 other kids in my class I could go talk to. It's really easy to like share ideas or opinions or just like ask someone a question that I might have. Yeah, everybody's really comfortable like helping each other out outside of class if you need, if you need help like finding a quote for your essay, or if you need someone to, to edit your essay or to help you out with something, everybody's definitely um, definitely like supporting one another mm -hmm. um, as we do stuff. And what about any, do you guys have any specific stories where something happened in the classroom that you can look back at and say like, oh, that would not have happened unless we knew each other well, like we do from that residential aspect of the class? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think there's a few stories. My personal favorite is one time a couple of the students in our class got into a rather heated debate. Yeah. Very exactly heated. We're talking about. Yeah. About, <laughs> about a couple of the aspects of globalization. And yeah. it was just interesting. It definitely wouldn't have happened if they didn't know each other as well. Because, <laughs> yeah, it was... Now, does, does the conversation stay academic, even though you guys know each other as well as you do? Yeah, it's, I think it stays academic, but I think especially for some people it becomes um, like personal almost, and that's not really a bad thing, I would say, because um, I, guess, I guess the simplest way I can say it is people try harder because they're competitive with one another. Yeah, I've had a, I've had a few classes that have been like that where I haven't had the residential, sem sem I haven't had the residential part of a class, but still, in other ways, the class encourages students to connect outside of the classroom. And when you have those connections, I feel like the 
dynamics of debate are a little bit more different. Like it just cha it challenges you to kind of push the way that you think, and you find yourself recentering yourself a lot more on different topics and issues than you might have if you were just simply stating your point of view uh, in a purely academic setting. Well, and I, w I would like to kind of turn over those same ideas and topics to Professor Kukreja. Um, from the professor's standpoint, uh, what kind of effects do you see of the residential seminar on your classroom setting? Well, I I'm really encouraged to hear what Dylan Stephen had to say about this discussion about globalization they've had in the in the hallways because uh, um, it sort of reinforces my impression that uh, they are having quite a bit <clears throat> go on outside the classroom context. Um, there's there's days before class I'll hear a lot of chatter in the classroom about about things that seem like they carry over from. Uh, stuff that might be going on, um, going on in the in the dorms and in the hallways, where these guys are having conversations about about the game, and that's that's exactly what this is all about: is a certain level of engagement and and uh, immersion into the the subject matter in in ways that perhaps may not happen otherwise. Um, for me, one of the more memorable occasions was a discussion we had one day, I'm sure these guys will remember, about FIFA and um, <clears throat> the banning of South Africa from FIFA um, under the reign of the former president of FIFA. Um, and <clears throat> whether or not that was the right thing for FIFA to do during the period of apartheid in South Africa. And these guys really ran with that discussion. I, I couldn't get a word in edgewise, and I was just sitting back in class and listening to them take over the conversation. And uh, they had some very so strong thoughts and views about this on both sides of both sides of the discussion. And uh, I wondered if there were times I've wondered if that conversation ever carried over. Maybe they they, they might recall something about it, but. You know, that's the kind of thing, really, that we hope that this, these seminars generate is a certain amount of passion and engagement with, in fact, one of the informal uh, terms we use around here on campus for these seminars is the passion seminars. And I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but uh, that's what it appeared to me that these yeah. guys were <laughs> engaged in. They're quite passionate about some of the uh, discussions we've had. So... I'm, I'm reassured by what they had to say. Yeah, from from the RA standpoint, we got an, we we got an email from Residence Life asking us first if we wanted to do a residential seminar in our hallway, and then we had to pick our top four or five. And I listed my I listed my top five and put down the beautiful game as my number one, and then went a little bit beyond that to write a short essay about why I have to be the RA oh, for, that, did, huh? for that. Well, yeah, I, I had, wow. I had really, I really wanted to take that class when I was a freshman, but didn't get to do that. And then from every level of the game, I've been a player, I've been a fan, a hooligan, and then last year I got to be, and somewhat this year I've been the manager of a couple different intramural teams. So I've gotten to experience the game oh. at a lot, of, at a, at a bunch of different levels, and so. I really wanted to be the RA of this hallway, and I specifically wanted to have it be a place where students would be engaging with each other in academic discussions. Because one of, one of the issues that I had last year in a hallway that wasn't part of a res sem was that I would get really excited about stuff going on in the classroom, but then you come back to your hallway and you want to talk about it with somebody. But I mean, when when everybody's taking different classes, you don't you're not you're never really on the same page. So. You kind of miss out on some of those discussions that I think you would have if you were in the residential seminar. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, that's where I think you guys have a really great. That's where I think the university has a really great program going. And so I'm, I'm glad. I'm really glad that they're expanding it. I, I agree. I think and what it does is it it also profiles the university in such a way that the first year experience here is is an intimate one, an intensive one. You know. I'm reminded of what both of them said, going back to the, your very in case your very initial question to them about why Puget Sound, and I think both of you in different ways said you wanted a small residential uh, college where where you'd feel like you fit in, and 
and you, you found a good match. And one of the ideas that these seminars hopefully help do also is to reinforce those sorts of relationships that you can build here and uh, that allow you to get into a lot more meaningful sort of academic discussions and conversations around the campus that illuminates so the academic culture of this place and if you from the ground up start off with that kind of a a taste then hopefully there's there's only up to go from there you know and we can build on that through your sophomore and junior years here where hopefully you also become mentors to other students who come after you sort of like you're doing now as an RA um, to create that environment outside of the classroom that that emphasizes the academics here and in, in a way that's that's engaging and fun really I mean I, I have a blast teaching this class and um, I would do it for the next 20 years if I could right um, in large part because it's a lot of fun and at the same time very intellectually engaging for me um, each time I do it I, I get to explore new material and, and read new things and been able to you know find new articles that I can I can supplemental articles that I can shoot off to them or links in the media that connect to things we're talking about in class that I shoot off to them so it keeps me kind of going as well so um, hopefully that that shows up in what students recognize about what this place really is all about well we only have a few minutes left before we have to take another break but we went to two different Seattle Sounders games. Uh, tell me about those guys. It was awesome. Um, I mean... It was, First it, off, it, it was yeah, awesome. It was, it was really cool. Um, uh, I'm from a area, so the only MLS games I had been to uh, growing up were Earthquakes games. And I love the Earthquakes, but um, I would say the, that the atmosphere of the stadium uh, leaves something to be desired. So definitely going to the Sounders games... Um, seeing all the fans, seeing how passionate they, that they are, um, and how, how they support their team, that was definitely really cool for me. And the other section of the beautiful game does not go to a Sounders game. Professor Kukreja, why did you want to integrate that as an element of the class? Uh, there, there are at least a couple of reasons. One is, of course, this being a residential seminar, um, I wanted to create some element of, of engagement with the game itself that was a little more experiential so that students got uh, a real sort of live uh, exposure to an educational experience. I looked at it as a sort of an educational experience for us all to go, go up to the, to the games. Um, <clears throat> and the other was that it really fit in with the segment of the course. At the time, we were, we were uh, pretty much talking about... about uh, football cultures and the different ways in which the game is experienced in different parts of the world and uh, one of the issues of course we we talked about was fan culture and uh, included in that was of course the subject matter of hooliganism in various parts of the world um, not that we would define Sounders fans as as, <laughs> as hooligans but there, there are quite a few passionate ones so this component of the course sort of fit with the timing of the couple of the games that we were able to make also and I thought it'd be a good thing for those who have been even to MLS games to having done these readings to see uh, see the the, the experience uh, in a slightly different light from a little more uh, of an academic vantage point but also experientially to be a part of that uh, Atmosphere. So that were that was those are the couple of reasons I thought made sense for us to to go up to the game. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, you're listening to Across Campus on KUPS. Stick with us. We'll be right back. All right, we'd like to give a shout out to Nick Campanelli. Nick, this is one for you, America. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Across Campus on KUPS. My name is Casey Krolcheck, and I'm the host of the show. Today in the studio, we're talking about the beautiful game. It's a residential seminar here at the University of Puget Sound. And so students live in a particular hallway together in the dorms, and then they also have a class together. And for this one, it happens to be the beautiful game. So we have two students in the studio, as well as their professor from the class. And so in this next segment, we're going to be talking about actual course concepts and what you guys have been learning about. 
And so I remember at the beginning of the year, uh, before and directly after we went to those Sounders games, you guys were writing essays about fan experiences and how fans relate to their clubs. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely what we were doing. And um, so for, for me, my, my team was the Earthquakes. Um, I'm from the Bay Area, so the Earthquakes are, are like my local MLS team. Um, and what my essay was about um, was, was basically how the Earthquakes are, are not the best supported um, MLS team in the world. Um, they actually uh, moved, the franchise moved um, from San Jose to, to Houston in 2005. Um, and then the franchise, franchise was kind of um, like resurrected in 2008. So um, yeah, they're not they're not not the most well supported team in the world. Not like the Sounders. They don't have that huge um, passionate fan base. Um, but but, they're, for, but they've got Wando. They've got Wando. <laughs> they've got idea. Wando. Wando is amazing. Um, he uh, he scores a lot of goals. Great player. Uh, my favorite player on the Earthquakes. Um, but. But yeah, I mean, um, earthquakes were earthquakes were my first my first live soccer game. Um, I remember I remember going to that game. Uh, it was pretty rainy, um, and I remember being all bundled up and I had my rain jacket on, and I was watching the game. And I was how old was I? I was probably nine, and I was at the age where it, it was either I either was having a great time or it was awful, and. As I was watching the game, I, I was just thinking to myself, "This is pretty cool." And for me, that was kind of um, the f when I like first um, fell in love with watching the earthquakes. So, yeah, I still I still still love watching them. They didn't do great this year, but uh, but they'll be back as long as they have a window. Yeah. <laughs> and so for the class, you guys picked a club that you're going to follow and evaluate. And Dylan, what was the club that you picked? Um, my club was Celtic FC. They're located in Glasgow, Scotland. And um, I wrote my first paper on the identity of the Celtic fan. And Celtic has a very strong Catholic identity within the city. Um, that's kind of what they were based on. They were founded as a Catholic club. And they kind of used soccer as a way for like the youths to like have something productive to do with their lives. Glasgow had a very poor economy when the club was founded. So soccer was kind of like a diversion for many people. And um, this identity has only grown as the teams gained one of the largest fan bases in the world. Um, they're an extremely popular club. They haven't been very successful recently, but traditionally they're one of the best clubs in the world. And um, I was kind of drawn to them since I was a little kid. You know, when I was younger, I always liked their colors. They were a foreign team. I was always interested in Celtic and wanted to know more about them. Um, as I got older, I started finding out that they didn't necessarily have the most respectable history. Um, there's a lot of history of hooliganism, and there's a lot of incidents involving Celtic fans getting into fights or partaking in not necessarily recommended behavior. <laughs> But um, as I've been researching them this year, I've found the club extremely interesting. They have a very rich history. And, yeah. well, and so, Stephen, you followed the San Jose Earthquakes from when you were a kid. And Dylan, you also were familiar with Celtic as you were growing up. How, has your under how have your understandings of your respective clubs changed as you've progressed through this course? Um, one thing that I think is, is really interesting um, that I've actually just been researching for this recent essay that we're writing uh, right now is um, like the surrounding sort of socioeconomic conditions in the Bay Area and how, how they've affected the earthquakes. Um, and in doing research for the essay, really what I found out is the, that the reason that the franchise was relocated in 2005 um, was because they couldn't find a soccer-specific stadium for the team, um, and the team wanted to kind of make that next step to develop their own stadium, to have their own fan base, um, to really, to really kind of get soccer going in the Bay Area, and they couldn't get that that specific stadium. Um, so, so the team decided to relocate. And one thing that we talk about in class is. Um, is how how a lot of like European teams and a lot of South American teams they aren't considered to be 
franchises like American teams are. The Earthquakes are considered to be a franchise, um, but but that term would never be used by by like passionate supporters in like Argentina or Brazil or in England. It's it's their club. It's their identity. Uh, whereas I think in America we have a much more sort of casual association with our teams. We just consider them to be to be like I said franchises and. Yeah, the, you always hear the quote like it's run, it's run it like it's a business. Yeah, it's a it's a business. It's it's entertainment. It's not there isn't a like a connection with um, with the supporters like there is with um, with soccer in different parts of the world. So yeah, that's definitely one thing that that I found really interesting that we that we talk about. Dylan, what about you? You talked a little bit a little bit about hooliganism. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about what that is exactly and how that's changed your understanding of Celtic? Yeah, um, hooliganism is kind of fans get riled up before games, and oftentimes different clubs will have their own group of hooligans, which will go around and they'll fight other clubs' groups of hooligans. And I was like fascinated to learn about it. I always known hooliganism existed, but... As we studied it, I found out that it's more of like an organized fighting than it's just random people randomly getting in fights. Um, often groups of people will call up other groups of people. They'll arrange meetings or they'll go searching for other fans with whom they could like fight or hopefully beat up, which I thought was extremely interesting. It kind of took away the innocence of the game for me because my whole life I've been a casual fan. I always looked at soccer teams just being a team and like, I judged them on their record. I didn't really know about what went on in the clubhouse or about the fans. I didn't really know about the history of the club. But as I've learned more about like the histories of clubs and like the real identities that clubs take on, like as portrayed by their management and their fans, soccer's definitely lost like a sense of innocence to me. Not necessarily in a bad way. I still really enjoy the game. I'd say I probably enjoy the game more than I did before taking this class. It's just I feel like I have like a deeper understanding of the teams instead of just looking at them as like a bunch of players. I understand like what they stand for and what they represent for different people around the world. Yeah, did you at any point look further into why exactly hooliganism occurs? Like how did that become part of the game? Um, yeah, we spent a lot of time looking into that. Um, for Celtics specifically, hooliganism kind of happens because Glasgow is a very divided city. Um, it's split up into pretty much two different sides, the Protestant and Catholic sides. And um, each of these sides has a soccer team. The Catholics have Celtic and the Protestants have the Rangers. And this is a very intense rivalry. Um, it's existed for a long time and solely because of the religious tension between the two groups. Um, the religion sort of adopted their team. Celtic was found as a Catholic club, but the Protestants sort of adopted the Rangers as a way to fight off the Catholics and like kind of defend their beliefs and hopefully well for them to kind of like gain control of the city not so much but assert dominance over the Catholics in the city there's extremely like large war between the two groups going on they kind of use football as like a method to like continue this fighting so for Celtic and the Rangers the reason hooliganism exists is the religious tension yeah, I just watched a really interesting movie the other day called Pelada. And it was two American students who had just who had just finished their undergraduate work and they had both played college soccer. And they were kind of one, like trying to figure out what they wanted to do with the rest of the, their lives. And before they before they ended up applying to graduate school or start writing books or wh whatever they were going to do with the rest of their life, they put together this project where they chased the game around the globe and they looked at different pickup games. In on almost every on almost every continent in, the, in North South America, Africa, uh, the Middle East, Europe, Asia, they kind of went all over the place. And at one point, they stopped in Jerusalem, and there was a game there that was divided between Arabs and Jews. Mm -hmm. And kind of like what you were saying, it's I mean, p people have argued that soccer is supposed to be this uniting force, and that's how they had previously view viewed it. But in some cases. Like the one, like the one that they that they showed in this movie, where it was just a pickup game of soccer, and it was divided between Jews and and Arabs. Uh, it didn't necessarily become a game that was a uniting force or something that brought about goodwill. Like yeah. 
Yeah, um, I think soccer definitely can bring people together. The fact that Jews and Arabs were praying, playing together, I think, is like a good sign. It means that groups with differences can come together in sport and compete against each other. They're not necessarily going to be best friends, but I think it's like a good sign that the two different sides could come together and play. A fight didn't break out in that game. You know, like there were some disputes, but everything went okay between the Jews and the Arabs. And I think it just shows that, like, although soccer doesn't always, like, promote good faith, it really can. And, I mean, Celtic's not a very good example, obviously. But, like, I think soccer really can be, like, a positive thing for different communities and bringing them together. Well, yeah, and it's by no... I've never thought that soccer is that ever that simple. Like, I think, if anything, classes like this and gaining a deeper understanding of football and the world surrounding it, it just... It's so much more complex than just good or just bad. And so I think that's part of why you guys are taking the class. But we're going to take a quick break. I'm going to hand it over to Imogen Barwick for station identification. You're listening to KUPS 90.1 FM, Tacoma, The Sound. Good morning again, everybody. You're listening to Across Campus on KUPS. I'm your host, Casey Krolchek. And today in the studio, we're talking about the residential seminar, The Beautiful Game. And we have Dylan Richmond, Stephen Baum, and Professor Sunil Kukreja here in the studio today. And in this last segment, we're just going to be wrapping up our conversations. But I kind of wanted to pose the question to you guys. How has this class, if it, if it has changed your experience of how you relate to the game, and how has that shaped your experience? Um, I think definitely what it's done for me is it showed really the huge effect that globalization has had on the game. Um, one of the books that we that we read in class, How Sagar Explains the World, there's a whole chapter um, talking about a Nigerian player named Edward and how he comes to play in the Russian Russian League or the Ukrainian League? One of the two. Ukrainian, Ukrainian League. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. It, it, it explains how, how basically a guy who had played soccer growing up in Nigeria got to kind of a uh, not really a major club, even like a minor club in Ukraine, um, and it explains how how soccer in in kind of the modern era is incredibly globalized, and how players like 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 Edward, like people from from Africa or from different parts of the world, will will almost be um, uh, like exported to to different parts of different parts of the world where they can um, where their skills can be most utilized. What they talk about in the book is how the Ukrainians are so like tactically rigid um, and they work really hard but they don't have necessarily explosive speed or, or skills and those are traits that can they can kind of be identified with Nigerian soccer and that's why um, people like Edward can can play in the in the Ukrainian league and can do well there. So Definitely for me, um, the class has taught me about about globalization, how it affects the game, and um, and how it explains kind of what happens what happens with the game today. And so, does that change who you're rooting for or what clubs you support? Um, no, <laughs> um, no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> which is okay. Which is okay yeah, too. It, it doesn't because um, because the, well, I. Like I said, I consider myself to be a fan of the Earthquakes. Um, they're they're like my local MLS team, and I support them. But on a on a much larger scale, um, I'm a Manchester United fan, and I oh. <laughs> I know every time I see Professor the, every time is I see I right see now. the uh, the the Suarez screensaver in class, I just die a little bit. <laughs> um, but I I kind of like we talked about at the beginning. I've I've watched Man United for so long, um, and I think even longer than I've watched the Earthquakes. And uh, for me, I there's just such a connection to the team, a connection to to the players that I've watched for so long, a connection to the manager, and what almost what draws me to them um, to, to, to to them so much is that there is there is such a desire among the team to to maintain. Um, maintain that that level of of like top quality, um, which I think is is really admirable. And what about you, Dylan? How has your 
If your experience has changed the game, how do you think you understand it differently than you used to? Um, like I said before, I feel like the game sort of lost its innocence to me. Um, we've spent a lot of time studying corruption in South American teams, or in Italy, it's apparently very common to bribe the officials in a match. And I'm just kind of studying things like this. This has really like changed my perception. How I used to think, oh, it's like a wholehearted game. It's like for fun. Right. And now I'm like starting to realize that it really is a business. And people are very invested in this financially and emotionally. And people will go to extreme stakes to win a game or to change a result if they can. Well, the interesting part about football is that there is passion, probably more so than I th than any other sport in the world. Definitely. But there's also the financial side, and it's interesting how you can see the passion kind of supersede the financial aspect of the game, which is kind of, is supposed to be kind of put a, a ceiling or restrictions on exactly how exorbitant your spending can be and where your club goes. I think, yeah, I think that's really been true in the past, maybe not so much recently. Um, we've been looking a lot at how recently superstardom has taken over. Um, clubs are bringing in the most expensive players. They're not really recruiting from like the local area. They're not bringing as many players out of the home city of the club. And they're kind of starting to alienate the home fans as well. We've been studying how TV deals have been making the games available to people around the world. However, the times have been changed so that maybe the local fans, it's more inconvenient for them to make it to the matches. And clubs are kind of prioritizing international fan bases over the local traditional fan bases, which has been very interesting to me. Well, and is that required for success? I think in the modern society it really is. If you want to stay relevant and if you want to stay powerful economically, you can't just rely on one city of people to fund your whole club. You really need to tap into international fan pools. And uh, Professor Kukreja, you've probably pushed this topic more than anybody else in the studio right now at least uh starting i mean you said you started out just playing soccer in right. malaysia and then you've progressed to push into the academics uh how has your understanding of soccer changed and if if that changes your, your experience of it how does it do that uh much along the lines of actually what dylan and, and Stephen have said um you know i ha i have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that there are multiple facets to the reality of the game and part of my objective in the course has been to bring that out uh, so while there is the beautiful game side of things what Dylan for example just spoke to was in many respects some of the ugly aspects of the game the realities of the 21st century economics on the sport or the violence and hooligan side of it or the corruption and uh, match fixing side of it and so by by exposing ourselves and coming to know a little bit more about the sort of underbelly of the sport um, or the game globally doesn't necessarily so much I think for me diminish the the enthusiasm for the game hopefully uh, just as it did for myself it also enables the students to have a much more sophisticated and nuanced a more complex appreciation of just how complex the game is intertwined with our lives just as in any other aspect of life there is the the good and the bad side of things right um, <clears throat> uh, we wanted to see also that in the sport itself we can't just look at the beautiful side of it and 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 then have a comprehensive understanding of of the sport in its modern uh, version, but also by looking at some of the darker side of the game, we better understand our world. And so you're still a season ticket holder for the Seattle Sounders. Is that to view the game from an academic standpoint, or is that for just for you to enjoy the game? On those days, I'm out there just churning more than like any other fan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for our episode today. You're listening to Across Campus. I'm your host, Casey Krolchek. We'll be back on the show next week, same time, same place, same radio station, 90.1 KUPS, The Sound. See you next week.